This is Tempest Tossed, Conversations on Migration and Mobility, and I'm Alex Alenikoff. It's about empowering people to take skills and then access the job market and to do with it what they want to do as individuals, not as flag bearers of a certain country. On the corner of Smith Street and Carroll Street in Brooklyn, New York, there's a restaurant in the shadow of plane trees now blossoming in the New York spring. This is Emma's Torch, a restaurant established as an educational program that offers culinary and job placement training for refugees, asylees, and survivors of human trafficking. The name Emma's Torch, like the name of this podcast, Tempest Tossed, is a reference to the Emma Lazarus poem that can be found on the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. Emma's Torch began as a pop-up cafe in 2018, and now in its current location, it offers a 12-week program that pays the refugee trainees. Just this March, Emma's Torch opened a cafe in the main branch of the Public Library of Brooklyn, and here trainees can learn barista skills, certainly crucial for the New York market. Programs like Emma's Torch are relatively rare in how the U.S. resettles refugees. The push from the federal government and the state governments are that that they enter the workforce as soon as possible so that they can leave assistance programs. But it may be that education and training up front can lead to a better level of self-sufficiency in the long run. The founder of Emma's Torch is Kerry Brody, who envisioned a program that could prepare refugees for the difficult New York job market. We sat down with Kerry to talk about the idea behind Emma's Torch and the way the program has developed over the past several years. And of course, the conversation discussed food. We then took a trip to visit Tu Pham, a graduate of Emma's Torch, who has found employment at Lot 2, a restaurant in the Greenwood Heights section of Brooklyn. There we also spoke to the owner of Lot 2, Danny Rojo. Carrie, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So tell me about you. How how did you get into this business? You're not trained as a chef. You didn't, uh, you aren't a restaurateur, but now you're you're running a restaurant with another another outlet in uh, the Brooklyn Public Library. How, How did you get into this? I grew up knowing exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to work in public policy. I was going to be the next Sam Seaborn, speech writing, Middle Eastern affairs, and I was very much focused on that. And so when I went to school, I studied Near Eastern policy. I ended up working at the Israeli embassy and then at the Human Rights Campaign um, in communications, which I absolutely loved. But I think it was one of those situations where you discover that the thing that you thought you were pursuing, the thing that you thought you knew you wanted to do, might not actually be the right fit. And at the same time, I was volunteering at a homeless shelter and having conversations with the women at that shelter about food, about their memories around, around food. And I came up with this crazy idea that we could be doing something else with the food system. We could be doing something that empowers people. In particular, my work at the Human Rights Campaign, I was working with LGBTQ asylees and so and asylum seekers. And so I was really interested in that population and had a crazy idea that someone else should pursue. And my husband eventually got sick of me talking about how someone else should do it and asked me, why not you? And so I spent a lot of time researching and trying to come up with a good enough reason not to do it and ended up leaving my job, going to culinary school, and and starting the organization, which has been quite a whirlwind of the last nearly three years. And you went to culinary school with the idea of Emma's Torch already in your, in your mind. Yeah. While I was doing, I was working, I was in culinary school 20 hours a week and spending the rest of the time doing some part-time work to make ends meet, working in different restaurants, and then talking to anybody who would speak with me about refugees, food, food justice, workforce development, really trying to become an expert in this and build the community that allowed Emma's Torch to to be launched. So the name of this podcast is Tempest Tossed, which obviously comes from the Emma Lazarus poem that you refer to as well. Uh, my wife came up with the name Tempest Tossed. I wonder where Emma's Torch came from. Emma's Torch really is derived from the fact that I've always been a giant history nerd. I think Emma Lazarus is one of the most fascinating women in history. She was a staunch advocate for refugee resettlement, and she really saw it as part of the American identity, and she saw it as a part of her calling. So let's talk about the program. You've got, you have running now a 12-week training program, and how many students uh, go through it? How does it work? What are the mechanics here? So our program is 12 weeks, spread out, you know, three months, where our students are with us for 40 hours a week. So it is a full-time job. The first month, we onboard six students every month. 
So the first month they're spending most of their time in our kitchen classroom. So they're learning the fundamental knife skills and everything that they're working on doesn't go to waste. It ends up in a sauce or in something, but it's really about getting those fundamentals and also getting acquainted with what it's like to work in a restaurant and practicing English skills, math skills, and those other skills that are required to create new careers. The second month, they are in our restaurant working on the line. Our menu is delicious, thanks to our culinary director, Alexander Harris, but it's also educational. It's really as though the menu is a syllabus. So if you look at our menu, you'll see that there are different cooking techniques. There are cold stations, hot stations, different ingredients. And the idea behind it is that Every item is correlated with a set of skills that our students need in the workforce. And then the final month, they're spending back at the Brooklyn Public Library, actually doing barista training, using our point of sale system, and at the same time, starting to go on mock interviews at different restaurants so that by the time they graduate, they know what is out there, where do they feel comfortable, where do they not feel comfortable, and what's an interview like. And then the final piece is that on their very last day, we host a graduation celebration where we invite a guest chef to work on a collaborative menu with our students. So our students create the menu with that guest chef, they present their dishes, and it's really a final exam for our students and a chance to bring in our guests to experience something truly unique. And your students are refugees, asylum seekers, and victims of uh, trafficking. How do you find these students? Is there an application process? Do you work with partner organizations? Where do they come from? We work with over 35 refugee resettlement agencies, homeless shelters, and social service providers who refer in clients to our program. Students' backgrounds are exceptionally diverse. And so what we're looking for is for the person who is going to be whose face is going to light up and be excited about food and, most importantly, excited about a career. We're not just a program for the sake of a program. We're really dedicated to this being the way that we can get people into the workforce. So I've eaten at Emma's Torch, and it was delicious. And um, as much as the food, the atmosphere is terrific. You've really put together a wonderful place there. But I must say, when when I was coming to Emma's Torch, and I think this may be true for a lot of your customers, um, I imagined um, a menu of kind of ethnic food, right? Of the the Somali appetizer and the and the Russian dessert or whatever. Given the students that you have there, um, and that's not what you've put together, as you say in your literature, which is a very I think wonderful catchphrase that it's a new American cuisine for new Americans. So tell me about the theory on that, about what you're, what kind of cooking you're trying to put together, and and why you selected that form of cuisine. So if you look at the history of culinary education, it is very rigid, and it hasn't changed very much. Escoffier has a theory of education that this is what it means to be an educated cook. And you can go to most restaurants in the city, and at some basic level, either the way the kitchen's set up, in terms of the kitchen brigade, that you have your garmanger, and then you have this station and that station— it still sticks with you that have your theory. What? What was the Garmanger first word? is, and I'm definitely mispronouncing it. I am the only one on our team who doesn't speak French, um, but it is the um, the cold station, really. It's salads, um, and so that mentality is something that is very, very important for our students to understand. Because I think for me, I thought when I first started doing this work that our students would want to cook the food from their country, and that everybody joining the program was basically a walking encyclopedia of the food of their country of origin. But as my culinary director, who's from New Jersey, jokes, it would be like assuming that somebody from, that everybody in New Jersey knows the recipe for ketchup. That's not necessarily the case. I have students who love their home countries, but are passionate about becoming Italian chefs, or are passionate about being pastry cooks, and they really want to do French classical pastry. And so for us, it's about what are the ABCs that are going to open the most doors. And so our menu is really devised around that. We do try to infuse it with different flavors or concepts that we've picked up from our students. For example, there's a dish on the menu now, which is fumboa, which has um, collard greens and peanuts. And it's, it's based on a Congolese dish with a similar braising green. And the idea behind that dish is we had a student who missed this this braising green from from the Congo and had a way of preparing it with peanuts, which is not very common in the U.S. And so how could we use that that idea and apply it to something that is quintessentially American, that this collard greens are something that are very familiar to especially Southern cooking? Um, 
But the way that we also think about it is that we want our students to graduate with these skills. And then similar to a master's program where you would do a culminating thesis, you learn you learn the fundamentals and then you apply it to something that's fascinating to you. And that's why our graduation dinner, we tell our students to cook, cook from the heart and present you on a dish. And so it's not about being hyper-authentic. I think some of those conversations can get very shrill. It's not about whether or not this is appropriating. It's about empowering people to take skills and then access the job market and to do with it what they want to do as individuals, not as flag bearers of a certain country. What percentage of your students uh, so far have have been able to get get jobs in the culinary industry in New York? So 95% approximately of our job-seeking graduates have begun careers. Kitchens in American restaurants are notorious uh, for class hierarchies, you know, the maitre d' out front and the waitstaff and the cooks and then the sous chefs and the dishwashers. And these are often filled by people of different races and different nationalities. How do you handle that at Emma's Torch? Do you see conflicts that way or how do you prepare your students for moving into a restaurant system in New York where race uh, and culture and class may may be defining characteristics for them. At Emma's Torch, we're trying to balance the the world that we want to live in and the realities of the world where we live right now. And so our culinary team is really insistent on full exposure and making sure our students know what they're walking into, but also know what they have the rights to demand. Oftentimes, the abuses that you read about in restaurants are because workers aren't informed of what they are supposed to be paid, of what they are supposed to demand from management. And I think we're seeing a huge shift right now with people being much more vocal about their rights. So one of the criticisms of the U.S. refugee program in the past has been that it was too eager to push people into the job market and there wasn't adequate training. You've broken through that by saying, no, no, we're going to start with training, give people a, a set of skills and not just ask people to be taxi drivers off the off the boat or whatever. Um, uh, but in that way, uh, how, what I'm wondering about is how food is different here than other kinds of training programs. What I mean is um, there are other training programs that teach people how to be uh, teachers or interpreters or work in the construction industry. Is there something special about food, do you think, or is this just another one of a, a set of skills that someone could learn? There's something unique about the universality of the experience of cooking. It's something that is inherently human and transcends borders and most importantly, language. So my memories of cooking with my mother in Maryland are not that substantially different than a student's memories of cooking with her mother in Iraq. And we might not speak the same language and the food would be different, but that shared experience is a really fundamental way of connecting people to a shared humanity. And so I do think that food has that power. And then on another level, food has the potential to be an incredible conduit for employment. About 9% of jobs in New York City are in the culinary industry, and they are highly skilled and highly respected, but they don't have the same barriers to entry, whereas teaching can have a high barrier to entry because of language barriers. Or there's a food has this ability to allow for entrepreneurship, flexibility of hours, and really a creative aspect that I think is built around respect that we we find really compelling. So it, it might seem sometimes that the, the Americans are more uh, interested in um, immigrant food than they are in immigrants. Do you think that Emma's torch um, uh, can be a, an intervention in that discussion that through n- not just having uh, Americans like different kinds of ethnic food, but rather can also begin to understand the importance of, of a healthy immigration system in the country as well? That is our vision long term. I think that if you look at different different changes and different social movements, a lot of change has happened at the level of human-to-human connection. And so for us, it's about making people realize that this new food or the food that you've already gotten used to that you love came here with another individual. And that if we don't allow those individuals in, then we are not going to have this amazing diversity and these amazing new flavors. I think that the way you do that is really one dish at a time. You can talk at someone about immigration for a very long time, but there is something so visceral about sharing a meal and about food that I I hope over time it will really promote change. Um, I, I was at the human rights campaign when marriage equality was passed and something that's always stuck with me from being at the Supreme Court that day were people talking about the change they've seen in their lifetime because they came out, because they talked about 
I am a teacher, a soldier, a chef, a whatever I am, and I also happen to be gay. And when people saw that in their neighbors, it made them change. And my hope is that we can also have that conversation change around immigration, that I am your neighbor, I am your barista, I am your chef. And by the way, I'm also an immigrant and you should be letting in more people. And so maybe it's Pollyannish, but that's that's our theory of change that, that we cling to. Carrie, thanks so much for spending time with us today. It's really Thank interesting you for having conversation. Me. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you much. so much. After talking to Kerry Brody about Emma's torch, we got in touch with one of the program's recent graduates, Tu Pham, who came to the U.S. from Vietnam. Tu is currently working at Lot 2, a restaurant in the Greenwood Heights section of Brooklyn. We took a trip on a sunny Sunday morning to Lot 2 to meet with Tu and the owner of Lot 2, Danny Rojo. Lot 2 has a pleasant neighborhood feel, a beamed ceiling, exposed brick, a place where you might be tempted to order the half-chicken pressed and pan-roasted with a homemade buttermilk biscuit or a hamburger accompanied by what Lot 2 describes as duck fat fries. First, we sat down with Danny to talk about how we came to hire an Emma's Torch graduate. Danny, we're here to talk to you today about uh, a two fam who is a cook in your restaurant, a fairly recent graduate of Emma's Torch, uh, and we wanted to follow uh, Tu's career as she moved into the New York uh, cooking and restaurant world. Tu's been with you how long? Tu's been with us since September, so uh, is that coming up on nine months, something like that? Um, Yeah, since September of uh, 2018. How did you come across Tu? How did you hire her? Uh, we were hiring for a part-time line cook. Uh, she wrote a lovely cover letter. Uh, she sent along her resume with her Emma's Torch experience, and we brought her in to trail with us, and she's been with us ever since. Danny, you, you've hired, I imagine, a lot of cooks over the 10 years you've been doing this. How did, what did you think about the preparation that Tu had received at Emma's Torch? Did she come to you well prepared for the job that you were looking to fill? Yes, she did. Uh, I would say she came very well re- prepared uh, with just good kitchen instincts, how to be safe, um, to stay behind you when you're behind someone, to knock on the door before you open it, lest you knock someone over. Um, and also she came just literally well equipped with a good knife and good kitchen shoes. Um, she was prepared to walk into a professional interview as a cook and come across as a professional cook. What cooking skills uh, do you think that Emma's Torch really instills in people that gives them a leg up in the, in the job market? I feel that Tu came here uh, genuinely wanting to continue learning, asking questions, taking direction, uh, enjoying going through the process with me when we're doing something like making mayonnaise or frying a French fry. Um, so those weren't necessarily skills that she came to me having gotten from there, but she came to me with the skills to get the skills, if that makes any sense. And I think that's a wonderful, uh, ambitious thing to try and, and impart on someone in such a short time frame. Did two contribute to the, to the atmosphere here, bring a new element to it? Uh, definitely. I feel like two is a huge part of the atmosphere when she's here. Uh, she can really lighten things up and help it to be fun. Uh, we listen to much more Whitney Houston than we used to. Too so nice to see you. Thank you for coming in on a Sunday, and it's it's great to see you in your in your environment here with uh, in the restaurant. Um, first of all, tell me when did you come to the United States? Thanks for having me. Um, I came here in uh, 2016. 16. Yeah. And in Vietnam, um, were you trained as a cook? Uh, not really, yeah. What I was, just love cooking, but not like a professional training. Yeah. What, was your, what was your work in Vietnam? I used to work in a non-profit uh, organization, uh, with, work with uh, disadvantaged children, yeah. Um, and uh, you're college educated in Vietnam? Yes, so you came to the U.S. with a college degree, having worked in a nonprofit organization uh, with disadvantaged children, but you faced a tough time finding work here? Yes, it's really hard for me to find a job in nonprofit here because in terms of my English. So that really hard 
tough time for me in the past. So how did you get to Emma's Torch? So I, um, I, when I was looking for a job and then I love cooking um, and I went to the um, refugee uh, organization. They have the um, street um, like um, market fair. So I met Kim, uh, the person who work, uh, works at the MS Torch. And then uh, um, I applied for the, that uh, the training. So they accept. How many other students were with you at the MS Torch program when um, you were there? Three other students. Uh, In my, um, uh, my cohort, is uh, four of us. Do you keep uh, in touch with your, your fellow students from Emma's Torch? Yes, I, uh, I do. Yeah. Are they all cooking somewhere? Uh, yes, one is uh, still uh, working um, her own catering. Uh, one is uh, the other working in the, um, the restaurant um, near Emma's Torch. What was that like to be training as a, as a chef and learning uh, cooking skills in this very multicultural environment? How did that work out? Oh, the, uh, for the first time, like, uh, I feel like really interesting because the, like uh, around me, like uh, from another cultures, like people from another um, cultures. And then we like, um, we have to listen to each other carefully and then how to le learn how to um, uh, interact. Uh, yeah, so that's really, um, I feel really interesting. Yeah. And did Emma's Torch um, try to, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the, the motto of the United States hmm. is e pluribus unum, which is a Latin phrase meaning out of many, one. Like and the, the, one of the, the stories of the United States is as a melting pot where all these different people come together and they become Americans. Did, did the ki was the kitchen like that, where all of you came from your different places, but together you learned the same set of skills that Emma's Torch was giving you? Or was there more of a uh, multicultural feel to it, where people were cooking based on their earlier experience? We still keep something uh, for ourselves, like, but like we're still learning same um, cuisine, um, same standard. Is that correct? Yes, uh, we uh, learn uh, like uh, to be a professional uh, chef in United States, so that's great. But like um, Emma Storch still like um, uh, encourage like um, us to be ourselves. For example, like um, when we each of us we will have like a dinner a graduation that where we can cook our cuisine, so we can show what. Uh, food, what dish is uh, uh, like uh, like ourselves? So that's great. Yeah. And when you cook for yourself at home now, do you cook Vietnamese food or are you making hamburgers with duck fries? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, sometimes I um, cook uh, Vietnamese and sometimes I uh, learn from a lot too. So I cook like, oh, I made uh, something, uh, real cheese at home too. That's really <laughs> awesome. And sometimes I crave for real cheese. Like, oh, that's like a uh, lot too. So <laughs> that's interesting. Right? Well, that seems to be the melting pot. If you're cooking melted cheese sandwiches, that's uh, that seems to be the melting pot. And has the... Has being an American chef affected the way you cook Vietnamese food? Um, yes, um, it's affect in a good way. Like um, uh, learn how to organize um, the kitchen, the in the restaurant. This is really like training myself, like discipline, uh, organize, and time management, like all kind of uh, skills. So I so, wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, w I understand that you may have an opportunity to go back to Emma's Torch to cook for one night Vietnamese food. Can you tell me about that? So I will cook uh, like um, pop-up Vietnamese uh, authentic uh, food in Emma's Torch in May. So um, I talked to Carrie and then she opened that opportunity to, for me to return, came back to, uh, come back to uh, Emma's Torch to Cook, yeah. Do you know what dishes you'll be cooking? Yes, 
I'm ready. Yeah. Can you tell this, us? Yes, five course. Um, um, so first, it will be like um, uh, shake, shake, uh, crispy shaking, uh, crispy rice, and the second will be uh, uh, green mango, and the third will be like um, famous uh, from uh, the north, like um, uh, fish and turmeric, and um, dill, and then. What would be like um, the um, pho, but uh, it's cold noodle pho, chua, as a uh, And then um, dessert would be like uh, banana pudding, coconut banana pudding. Yeah. So you'll be you'll be cooking at Emma's Torch for for a night in, in May, and the food will obviously be the the center of that. But do you also want to bring a little bit about Vietnamese culture as part of the story as well? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. Yeah, that um, uh, mm, yes, because um, one of my um, um, point is like Vietnamese. Uh, I learned from my mom. Like she really good at cooking, and then um, and then uh, cooking and serve other people is also show love. So that's um, what what I want to show in my uh, pop up, and then this um, the second will be like a little bit um, different um, uh, dish from uh, the north to the south, so also related to culture. Yeah. So what 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 would you like to be doing in five years from now? Uh, I would uh, love to have my own studio, cooking, uh, show people how to cooking uh, Vietnamese food. So we're back in the Dodge 112 studios now, and I'm talking to Pernille Kaufman, who helped conceive, develop, and produce this episode of Tempest Tossed. And Pernille, when we first thought about this episode, we thought that we would find Emma's Torch as a place where refugees cooked their their native cuisine, the cuisine of their home country, and introduced it to uh, the New York palate. But that's not what we found. What? How would you describe how the episode evolved? When we started this episode, we quickly found out that Emma's Torch is actually a venue offering standard American cuisine and that it was more important for refugees who came to work there to find a way to start, way to start a new life and to support their families than it was for them to share their cuisine. And this is what Emma's Torch is helping them do to train them to enter the American job market. And I suppose that's what we found also at Lot 2 Restaurant, where Tu was cooking uh, duck fat fries uh, and not her traditional Vietnamese food. When we met uh, Tu, we found out that at Emma's Torch, she had learned to find a job in America rather than teaching Lot 2 how to cook Vietnamese food. And it seemed like she felt very empowered by that. Pernille, thanks so much for your help on this episode. Thank you so much for working with me. You've been listening to Tempest Tossed, a production of the Zolberg Institute on Migration and Mobility at the New School. This episode of Tempest Tossed was conceived, developed, and produced with the assistance of Pernille Kaufman. Our engineer is Sahil Ansari at Dodge 112, and theme music composed by Eli Elenikov. We would welcome your comments and suggestions for future episodes. And you can reach us by emailing us at tossedtempest at gmail.com. That's tossedtempest, all one word, at gmail.com. <laughs>